Thank you very much, Bruce. I was wondering if I was on my way out the door when you started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyway, our membership brochure. Uh, we've had a membership brochure for quite a few years, and it needed updating. So this summer, we took that upon ourselves to see what we could do to bring it up to date. And this is the finished product. We have lots of them at the back of the room. It tells a bit about what we have done uh, as a historical society through the years. It also explains a bit about what we do at our monthly meetings. And on the back, there is an application form if anyone would like to join the society. It's all right there. So it tells about the meetings, where they take place. Um, I think we've covered everything in it. So if you have uh, some friends or anyone who you think might be interested in becoming a member, if you want to pick up one of the brochures at the back and take it to them, we'd be, there's lots there, so please help yourself and uh, we'll see what we can do. Maybe we will really fill this room to capacity. We're getting pretty close. Anyway, that's our membership brochure. And now my next project is to introduce our guest speaker. David is already known to many of you. He grew up in Collingwood, and he's very enthusiastic about the history of our town. Each month, David sends us a story about the history of Collingwood, which he has researched and written, and it is posted on our Historical Society website. So I hope you've checked them out, because they're, they're really fascinating. I just, I look forward to receiving his email every month with the new story. So David, it amazes me with the factual content and the detail that he has in these stories, because he doesn't live here in Collingwood anymore, but he's almost 3,000 miles away in Victoria, BC. But he really manages to have a very interesting story each month. He's an amazing source of information on the history of our town, and I'm very happy to welcome him home again, and I look forward to tonight's presentation, The Great Fire of 1881. So welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, before I begin, I want to give a very special thank you to Carol Stewart at the library for providing me with the local newspaper accounts of the fire, and also Melissa Shaw, Jackie Plater, Lindsay Cook of the Museum for putting together this evening's slideshow, which is being operated by Tyler Cleary down here at the front. Without your assistance, this evening would not happen. So, here we go. Most pioneer communities have had disastrous fires in their early days. Before the advent of municipal waterworks, fire hydrants, fire-resistant buildings, and the modern firefighting equipment that we take for granted today, there were fire hazards aplenty in the pioneer days, and there was always the risk of major conflagrations coupled with the challenge of dealing with them, given the lack of infrastructure of the time. The Collingwood is no exception to this, and where there have been many disastrous fires since the founding of the town in the 1850s, but one of them stands out above all the others, not only in its magnitude and the extent of the devastation it caused, but also in the way it reshaped and redefined our downtown business section. We call it the Great Fire. Three days after the fire, the Bulletin newspaper carried headlines in bold type stating, Collingwood in flames, half the business of the town destroyed, the mischief done in 30 minutes, a quarter of a million lost. Here's how it happened. It was a late Sunday afternoon, September 25th, 1881. This was around the time of year when the Great Northern Exhibition is held, so any of you who have lived here for a long time, you know what the weather can be like in late September. Think of last Friday afternoon when we nearly blew away. Now, because it was a Sunday, the stores were closed. Families were at home observing a day of rest and preparing for the evening meal and the evening church service. The volunteer firemen were also at home simply because there was no one on standby at the fire hall in those days. Shortly, you will see how these and other circumstances combine into a perfect storm to reshape downtown Collingwood in a way that we can still recognize today. Around 4.30 p.m., an alarm was sounded after smoke was reported coming from the premises of J.W. Carey, a boot and shoe manufacturer, located in a wooden building on the east side of Huron Ontario Street between Simcoe and Huron. 
Now, the popular legend has it that the main street consisted of primitive wooden buildings that burned down and subsequently the stalwart businessmen of the town, instead of focusing on the size of the devastation from the fire, instead focused on the size of the opportunity and rebuilt the main street with substantial and handsome brick buildings, many of which remain to this day. Now, this is only partially true, as you will soon see. Now, we have our first photo, and here we have does that look like the Chicago of the North to you? <laughs> what we have here is a view looking south up here Ontario Street from the corner of Huron and First. And these buildings were in of wood, as you can see here. It's a very early view from about 1860, looking south. Uh, the uh, building that has the distinctive checkerboard front over there on the far left was the uh, store of T.G. Bowles. The man standing in the street appears to be the only living person in town other than the photographer. <laughs> there isn't even a horse in sight. Now our next photo, taken at about the same time, shows the street looking north. And this is the east side of the street, and you see the North American Hotel there, the two-story building with its name in big letters across the front. And the next photo is also of that building, and Charles Cameron's name is over the door on the left, and Charles Cameron himself is seated in the buggy. And that hotel stands in the spot now occupied by the three-story uh, Carmichael block, and that's our next photo. And you know that building well, it's still there, and uh, it currently contains uh, Engel and Volkers, uh, the lively olive and soul kitchen. When that building was first constructed, it was known as the Callery Block. It was owned by Bernard Callery, who, when he was the mayor of Collingwood, he died very suddenly of heart failure in 1896. Now, as we will see shortly, by the time of the Great Fire, this block on the east side of here, Ontario Street, actually contained a mix of wooden and brick buildings, plus one house built of stone. Most of the wooden buildings were of one or two stories, and the brick buildings, some of them quite substantial, stood two or three stories tall, and two of them had a fourth floor in the shape of a mansard roof. On the west side of the street, there was also a mix of newer brick buildings and older ones. Commercial buildings of brick had existed in Collingwood from at least 1861, 20 years before the Great Fire, and the first one is believed to be that of John McMaster's store on the corner of St. Marie and here on streets, and it still stands there today. It's now the site of the Shipyards Medical Art Center. In the 1890s, that building became the Queen's Hotel. Now, many of you will remember in the 1960s, the Queen's Hotel was derelict and all boarded up, and uh, looked like it might have been ready for demolition. And a school friend of mine joked that if Queen Elizabeth ever came to Collingwood, they'd have to put her up at the Queen's Hotel. <laughs> and I think the ladies of the IODE would have had something to say about that. So our next photo, we have a view looking south. Now this photo tells us several things. You see David Williams writing in the upper corner there, uh, indicating here Ontario Street Collingwood before the fire of September 25, 1881. Close inspection reveals that except for a horse-drawn wagon in the distance up near the corner of 2nd Street, and two more wagons in the next block beyond, and one parked on the east side, here Ontario Street appears deserted. There doesn't appear to be a single pedestrian in sight. And this hardly looks like the boomtown Chicago of the North that Collingwood was in those days. You note the long shadows on the right-hand side, indicates the photo was taken in the late afternoon, and this leaves the buildings on the east side of the street in full blazing sunlight. Now, please note the wooden verandas in front of every building, these helped to spread the fire along the street so quickly, so that when the newspaper headline said the mischief done in 30 minutes, they, they really meant that. That's how quickly it spread. I think we could be justified in guessing that this photo was taken on a quiet Sunday afternoon. The street may well have looked like this on the Sunday afternoon of the fire. Another thing this photo shows us is the mix of wooden and brick buildings. Now, there's a brick building that is just barely visible. It's on the very, very left of the picture. You can just see some two colored bricks there. Uh, that is the building of Melville Fair and Company. And at the very top, you can almost just see the angle of the Mansard roof. That building will figure prominently in our story. And when we compare this photo with the next one, 
which is looking north, um, it confirms that building to be Melville Fair with the mansard roof. And that is a spot which is now 35 here Ontario Street, and you know it as Dollar Villa. Now up there you can see T. Long and Brother. That was the first building with a mansard roof. And farther on, it's not easy to see, but just before the weather vane on Lindsay's building, there's another building with a mansard roof. And that is the point at which the firefighters succeeded in stopping the progress of the flames. Now the next photo, which is, um, was that the next one? Um, Tyler, do you have one that shows uh, a building with a weather vane on it? No, no, go back. I, I, I'm sorry, we already had that. Yes, okay, that's fine. The weather vane. Um, now, to give you an idea of the amount of fuel that existed for a major fire in 1881, I want you to consider the following. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, consider the following. In addition to wooden buildings, you have, you have wooden sidewalks, you have wooden verandas, every building's got a, a wooden veranda, there's multiple layers of paint and varnish, there's kerosene lamps, livery stables with plenty of straw and hay for the four-legged motive power that existed at the time, two-story wooden buildings with balloon-style framing where the wall studs ran the entire height of the building in one piece from the foundation to the attic provided an additional fire hazard because the empty space between the inner and outer walls acted like a chimney and could conduct flames from ground level right to the attic and to the roof in mere minutes. If you add to this the wood lath on the interior walls for plastering and the amount of fuel present for a disastrous fire is very significant. And many of you know that downtown Collingwood was originally a cedar swamp. Now I'm wondering, you know, if some of those cedar trees made their way back to here Ontario Street via the sawmills and in the form of uh, plaster lath for the, some of those buildings. And that again would contribute to a quick spread of the fire. Balloon frame walls were so called because critics, speaking about their light construction, said they blow away like a balloon in a light wind. Now even though there is an unlimited supply of water in Georgian Bay, there were no fire hydrants in Collingwood simply because there were no municipal waterworks. They were not installed until 1889, eight years after the fire. And while there was a volunteer fire brigade to fight the fires, they depended on someone with a team of horses showing up to haul the steam-powered fire engine simply because the town of Collingwood could not afford the expense of keeping a team of horses on standby. Under circumstances like this, a fire could, and often did gain, a significant headway before the firemen even arrived on the scene, and it took much of that with it. As mentioned earlier, the fire started under the wooden sidewalk at Carey's Boot and Shoe Store. The cause is believed to be a discarded cigar butt that was dropped through a hole in the wooden sidewalk. If this is correct, it was the most dangerous cigar in Collingwood's history. <laughs> it created a lot more ashes than it was intended to. Due to the uneven dirt surface of here Ontario Street, the sidewalk was elevated some distance above the ground at this point, and there was a strong southwest wind blowing to fan the cigar butt and set aflame the rubbish under the sidewalk and within half an hour, much of the block was in flames as the fire galloped along the wooden verandas and took hold of the buildings they were attached to. If you keep in mind the quietness of a Sunday afternoon in that era, it might have been a situation where a gentleman was walking along the, the east side of the street, perhaps on his way to the Grand Central Hotel, or perhaps going the other way toward the harbor. Whatever the case, when he carelessly discarded his cigar and went on his way, he was blissfully unaware of the legacy he was about to leave to the town of Collingwood. The, the fire quickly spread to the north and also south to the corner of Simcoe Street, where the heat scorched the bricks of the Grand Central Hotel on the opposite side and nearly set their stable on fire. That location now is, it used to be the Bank of Montreal, it's now a restaurant called The Strand. From that point on the corner of Simcoe Street, the fire burned its way across the north side of Simcoe Street to St. Marie and then down the west side of St. Marie and also took in the storehouses, outbuildings and stables in the area of the back lane. And despite the 99 foot width of here Ontario Street, the heat was so intense it also set a number of wooden buildings alight on the west side as well.
Um, it has been mentioned before that the stone wall in front of the terrace at 219 here Ontario Street near the corner of 4th is believed to have survived the Great Fire. Well, it did indeed because the flames didn't extend any farther north than the corner of Simcoe Street. <laughs> so, sorry to dispel that legend, but that's how it happened. And it was because the strong wind was blowing out of the southwest, uh, it, it caused the flames to go the other way. Now, except for a stone house owned by Charles Cameron and unoccupied at the time, the buildings all south of Longs there, you can see, I don't know what I'm doing to make this work. Joan, what do I do? Please press the button. Okay. Now this is Long's four-story building, and from here, coming this way, everything is wood right to the corner of Simcoe Street, except for a stone house. So, um, what happens here? We now have our next photo showing Archer and Fluent's store. This is the corner of Simcoe Street. There's Swain's ice wagon, uh, with the ice sitting in the dirt, <laughs> two different kinds of dirt. <laughs> on the opposite side of the street, over there you've got the, the tall uh, brick portion of uh, Telfer's building. And um, the next photo, the bird's eye view of Collingwood, shows in some detail. Now many of you may have these from the museum, uh, they're in the cover of Christine Cowley's book. And when you look at it with a magnifying glass, you can see that from, from the corner of, um, this is Smith's Wharf here, so this is here on Terrier Street, from the corner on, there's some very large brick buildings, as well as the wooden ones. And then the flames also consumed nine houses and several stables on Simcoe and St. Marie, and all of this again aided by the wind. The Northern Railway Station buildings, which were just out behind us here, and the platform were on fire a number of times due to the strong wind blowing sparks and flaming debris to the east. And the railway employees repeatedly saved the premises with their valiant efforts. Our next photo is of Toby's Tannery. Now, this was located more than half a mile away at Simcoe and Niagara Streets, and they caught fire as well. And here, there was much cordwood and tan bark used in their business, and a very large quantity was burned. The newspaper said about 150 cords was uh, burned. And in the meantime, Mr. Toby and his employees, they struggled to save the tannery building and they were successful, however, it burned down on April 20th, 1885. They rebuilt it and it burned down again in October 1896. So they weren't terribly lucky there. Huron Street was also referred to as Front Street in those days. And here, merchants had time to pack up all or most of their goods in readiness for a quick retreat in case the flames reached that far. And in my research at the library today, I was looking at a an account of a fire in 1905, and it happened in 1881, it happened in 1905, where merchants started piling their goods outside, and people were standing there waiting to take it and steal it and, and abscond with it. So it happened a number of times. So what sort of a fire department did we have on that fateful Sunday? Well, you're all familiar with Collingwood state-of-the-art fire hall at the corner of 3rd and High Street. In 1881, our next photo. The fire hall was on the ground floor of this wooden building. Doesn't always work. There we go. Here's the, the doors for the fire hall. And um, this palatial building was constructed in 1858. It also served as the first town hall, the Orange Lodge Hall, and the first high school. All three of those functions on the upper floor accessed via the grand staircase on the right. The next view shows the building again. That's uh, even an earlier view. You can see there's a ramp there for the uh, fire engines to come out the uh, big double doors. And there's a small tower there for a small bell on the roof. Now that building was moved across the street from its original location, much altered. It still exists as a house on the west side of St. Paul Street. We drove by there the other day. It's opposite the Cenotaph. It's number 38, and I see that it's now a duplex. Their entrances are 38A and B. Ten years before this great fire, a steam-powered pumper had been purchased from the Silsby Manufacturing Company of Seneca Falls, New York. Seneca Falls, for many years, was known as the fire engine capital of Western Hemisphere. 
The brigade named their engine Georgian, en Georgian Fire Engine Number no. 1, and it would serve Collingwood for 66 years until 1937, when it was sold to Chester Stewart for $40 and towed to a scrapyard. And that is our next photo. Here it is, and the date is April 21st, 1937, and the Silsby steam pumper is being towed to the scrap heap by Fred Eldon's team of horses. Sitting beside Fred is Chester Stewart, who bought it. Standing is Oscar McCarl. And the next photo, this is what a Silsby looked like in its prime. Now this one is beautifully restored, and that's, that's what uh, Collingwood's would have looked like originally. This heavy unit required a team of horses to pull it, and since the town did not own a team of horses, the volunteer brigade had to rely on a resident showing up with his own horses. The first person to do so, and hitching up to the Silsby after hearing the alarm, was paid $3, according to a town bylaw of 1884. And while the volunteers waited for a team of horses to show up, they lit a fire in the boiler of the Silsby in order to have working steam pressure by the time they reached the fire. My research indicates that a Silsby could produce steam from cold water in three to five minutes using either coal or wood for fuel. A second piece of equipment was the hand-pulled, hand-operated pump. That is our next photo. We have two different ones to show you here. Now, these were and are known still today as hand tubs. They had a water reservoir or a tub that was filled with a, by a bucket brigade, or they could draft water from a nearby well, stream, or pond if it were available. Depending on the size of the machine, it took between 10 and 20 strong men on each side to work those long wooden handles, which were called brakes, as in the brake in your car. Why they use that term, I'm not sure. But they had to work these handles up and down at a frantic speed, like human pistons, to produce a stream of water from a hose. One complete up and down motion of the brakes was called a stroke, and these machines were operated at more than 60 strokes a minute. And we have another photo. Uh, this one is more up close. You see this one has a number of fancy red buckets hanging underneath the bell in the center, uh, so the bucket brigade could try to fill the tub quickly. And they also have some heavy hoses for drafting perhaps from a well. And those wooden handles were quite the thing. And if you look up on YouTube, just type in hand tub fire engine, you will see some amazing videos of these restored machines being operated in competitions. And just how frantic and intense the action is to make them work. The men could pump for only a few minutes to avoid exhaustion, and then they had to be spelled off by another group. And this required a large number of volunteers to keep it going. And during the changeover of personnel, the rapidly moving handles could and did break fingers, hands, and arms. So it was quite a hazard to be a volunteer fireman to work one of these things. Topping off the list of Collingwood's equipment was a hand-pulled hose reel. Now, as for hearing the alarm, the fire hall, as we saw a little while ago, had a small tower in which there was a small bell, the sound of which apparently did not carry very far. I have seen it described as a tinkle bell. <laughs> but eventually, they made arrangements to use the large bells in the Methodist Church on Maple Street, that's today's Trinity United, and All Saints Anglican Church on Elgin Street. Those large bells could be heard far and wide throughout the town as it then existed, but access to ring them was not always guaranteed. There was no one at the fire hall between fires, and since the volunteer firemen all had day jobs, they too needed to be able to hear a bell and drop what they were doing and head for the fire hall. And on their way, they also had to hope that some quick-thinking citizen had also heard the bell and was on his way with a team of horses to pull the pumper. <laughs> so, there's a lot involved in actually getting apparatus to the fire. So I could just imagine several teams of horses showing up at the fire hall all at the same time, and the owners arguing over who got there first, who was going to have the distinction of pulling the engine as well as getting the then significant sum of three dollars compensation, and all the while precious minutes are elapsing while a building burns down. In larger centers like Victoria, B.C., where in the mid-19th century there were two independent competing fire engine companies based on politics, you can see where this is going, can't you? Um, the, they had scenarios where the volunteer firemen argued about who got to the site of the fire first, who was going to attach the hose to which engine, 
Disputes like this amounted to an insult to the manliness of the competing engine companies. And in one case, while the dueling testosterone resulted in a prolonged fist fight in the snow, the men totally oblivious as to why they were even there, the fire burned itself out. I mean, it sounds like a, an old silent movie, doesn't it? Now, earlier we saw a weather vane on the roof of James Lindsay's Masonic building. And this must have indicated to the firemen what they were up against and likely contributed to the ultimate decision to let the wooden buildings burn and to concentrate their efforts on stopping the northward advance of the flames at the four-story brick building of Melville Fair and Company. Now, remember, there's no water mains, so what do you do? Well, without water mains and fire hydrants, they were limited to drawing water from a nearby tank in the ground at the foot of here Ontario Street. This tank was fed by gravity from the harbor and therefore had an unlimited supply of water from Georgian Bay, but it was not under pressure. Normally that tank was used for sprinkling the dirt streets with a horse-drawn water wagon to keep the dust down, but on this day it was needed for something much more serious. Another problem, there was no hook and ladder company at the time and this was hotly debated the next day. Some felt that if a hook and ladder company had been active, they would have been able to pull down the wooden verandas and the advance of the flames could have been halted much sooner, saving more of the brick buildings. In one case, two citizens, Mr. Palmer and Mr. Livingston, seized a pole and demolished the veranda in front of Lindsay Hunter and McDonald's store, that's the one with the weather vane. The next building to the north was the wooden North American Hotel, which we saw earlier. And uh, with this strong wind blowing from the southwest, it doesn't take much imagination to visualize the sparks and flaming debris that the wind carried to the east. Because Long Brothers building, they said it collapsed like a house of cards. Now you can imagine a four-story building just going whomp like that, and all of the flaming debris that went into the air. And of course the wind carried that to the east, even as far as Toby's tannery. And throughout the history of of fires in Collingwood, the wind seems to have been a major risk factor in spreading the flames. So the telegraph wires were humming down to Stainer requesting assistance. A train went to Stainer and brought their steam fire engine on a flat car, arriving about 7 p.m. And we can be sure it was met by a team of horses. <laughs> I suspect very few people in Collingwood slept that night, and perhaps uh, the evening church services may have been cancelled as well. Now, as the flames advanced, merchants attempted to remove as much of their stock as possible, which they piled outside, and unfortunately, there was much looting. In particular, a great deal of the stock of watchmaker M. Cooper was lost or stolen. The newspaper said, Complaints were so numerous of the quantity of property stolen that Mayor Adam Dudgeon issued a proclamation on Tuesday morning warning all persons against detaining any property which had come into their possession without reporting the fact to him. Some merchants had insurance, some did not. I think it's similar to these days. My great-grandfather, R. W. O'Brien, a grocer at the time, who also sold crockery, glassware, flour, and feed, saved some of his stock, and he wisely had $1,000 insurance. That was a significant sum of $1,881, equal in value to $23,255 in $2015. In our home, we had a pair of figurines of a boy and girl that had the date 1881 written on the underside, and these were rescued from great-grandfather's store during the fire and taken to his home at the corner of 4th and Pine Streets. I just want to acknowledge there are, besides myself, there are several other descendants of R.W. O'Brien in the audience tonight. Well, thank you for coming. Given the time of year, some of these merchants' losses were very high because they'd already received their fall stocks, because it was late September. For great-grandfather O'Brien and his older brother, Fred, one of the volunteer firemen, this was a case of déjà vu, for they had witnessed the same thing happen to their father's store in Barrie in 1864. Perhaps my great-grandfather learned from that event in Barrie and made sure he was adequately insured. He was back in business in a short time. Now, on the west side of here, Ontario Street, there were a number of wooden buildings in the space that's now occupied by the Federal Building. They caught fire simply from the heat on the other side of the street. And on that side, the southward advance of the flames stopped at the Bank of Toronto in the Telfer Block. The bank was seriously damaged, but saved by the heroic efforts of the bank employees, the Telfer brothers who owned the building, 
and others who volunteered to stop the roof from catching fire. So our next photo shows on the right um, the Telfer block and the um, former Bank of Toronto has the rounded arch windows and door. Today that is the site of, today it just says flowers, it used to say Smarts Flowers. It's the site of flowers and Carlson Wagonly travel. The brick, the brick building on the very far right, which was built after the fire, was the home of the Enterprise newspaper until 1932. Now, others fought to save the wooden buildings that were behind here on the way up to Pine Street, but fortunately the wind was in their favor. Wooden buildings north of the Bank of Toronto, keep in mind the one on the far right was not there yet, so the wooden buildings north of there uh, were consumed until an empty space prevented the flames from advancing any farther towards the north. To the north of this spot was the large new brick block being constructed by Long Brothers and Charles Cameron. That's our next photo. So this very substantial three-story, two-story, two-story, three-story, this substantial building stood immediately north of the federal building in what is now Loblaw's parking lot. Some of you will remember that Gibson's Fish and Chips was in the far left end of that tall part back in the 60s. And by the time of the 1953 fire, the three-story portion on the far right and the two-story portion next to it, they were already gone. Uh, apparently demolished many years ago, as Alice Belcher told me a very long time ago. In 1953, Foley's Furniture and Morton Ockermore's shop were in the remaining two-story section, and Max Faith and Walker's were in the three-story section. Our next uh, photo shows the north end of that same block of the street. The advice to smoke old chum tobacco is facing out into Cameron Park, which I'm told went right through to Pine Street. The people standing and sitting on the roof of the Globe Hotel are there to watch a ship launching of the Royalton on August the 9th, 1924. The photographer was on the roof of the shipyard boiler shop. The next photo is a more close-up view. There are lots of uh, horses and wagons here. Uh, the street is all dirt, as you can see. And on your left, um, the, the second building in from the left, you can see the distinctive rectangular masonry plaque on the uh, Lindsay's Masonic building. And this is how it looked when it had newer buildings on either side of it. Farther up the street on the right, you can just barely make out part of the words printing office. That was and still is the building to the south of the federal building, the home of the Enterprise. And I believe there's a restaurant there today. Now, the types of businesses that occupied the buildings destroyed in this fire sold the necessities for daily living. They included several general stores, grocers, dry goods, boot and shoe makers, hardware, tinsmith, saddler, furniture, druggist, clothing, printing and books, confectionery, watchmaker, a millinery shop, and Sheffield's restaurant. Now, Pam and I had lunch, had, uh, rather, we had breakfast this morning at um, Joseph Lawrence House with uh, Carolyn and Sylvia Wilson. And um, they have confirmed that the proprietor of Sheffield's restaurant in 1881 was their, their great-grandfather, a young man of 26 at the time. And then in the 20th century, his son, Russell Sheffield, opened another location on Highway 26 on the west side of town, and years later, that became the famous Sheffield Cedar Inn. And many of us old-timers went there for Sunday evening dinners a long time ago. Now, the account in the Bulletin newspaper states that the hand-operated fire engine was worked until its supply of water ran out and it could do no more. That was the one with the buckets. The steam fire engines, meanwhile, drawing water from the tank connected to the harbor, concentrated their efforts on the four-story building of Melville Fair and Company, and for eight hours they directed two streams of water into that building, thoroughly soaking it, thoroughly flooding it, destroying all the stock, the mansard roof and the top floor were completely gutted, and this is where they succeeded in stopping the northward advance of the flames toward Huron Street. And it was stated that if the flames had passed through that building, now in this photo here, disregard the building on your far left, and the next three 
are all brick. And if the, if the flames had burned through those three, it then would have got into the wooden North American Hotel, and that would have conducted the flames all the way to the corner of Huron Street, where there was a massive three-story graves block, a brick building. And they say from that point, the Globe Hotel and all of Huron Street could have been lost as well. So it was a pretty serious thing. Uh, the two steam pumpers worked until 4 a.m. The Stainer fire engine went home on an early train, and then the Collingwood fire engine had to return at noon the next day to wet down the smoldering remains. Many merchants had to stay up all night to guard their stock and keep watch on their buildings. And you can be sure that few people slept that night. James Lindsay's music hall upstairs over at E.R. Carpenter's drugstore was damaged by water, but fully insured. The upper floors of the totally destroyed buildings contained variously the law office of Mr. Henry Robertson, the law office of Mr. John Burney, the architectural office of Messrs. Kennedy, McVitie, and Holland, the Odd Fellows Lodge Hall, and a millinery shop. The architects Kennedy, McVitie, and Holland had their head office in Barry, calling what was a branch office, and they lost a large number of valuable plans and documents and several sets of valuable instruments, and none of that was insured. Now, the next photo. So here we have James Lindsay's Masonic building when it was freestanding. There's a, you notice there's a space between it and the North American Hotel. There's a space between it and the next wooden building. And there's that famous masonry plaque in the facade. Now, that building survived the fire, and it lasted more than 20 more years into the early 20th century until January 17, 1905, when it was totally destroyed. The next photo, which we've seen before, this is a repeat, but again, this points out the same building with brick buildings on either side of it, and that's how it looked in the 1890s. Now, if you note the, the dirt road, there's wooden sidewalks and wooden ramps to get across the ditch. Storm drains were a thing of the future. After Lindsay's building was destroyed by fire in 1905, on its site was erected a two-story building that in the 1950s contained the Collingwood Dairy and Creamery and still stands there today, being the site of Pamper Me Day Spa and Rustic Charm. The two brick buildings to the south, uh, with E.R. Carpenter's drugstore and that of Melville Fair and Company, were repaired and they remained standing for 80 more years until November 14, 1961 when an explosion in the Chalet Norman Steakhouse resulted in a massive fire that destroyed both buildings and seriously damaged the Collingwood Dairy to the north and the Public Utilities Commission building to the south. My mother's brother Howard Hewson and his family living upstairs over Hewson's menswear, which is now poised on Main, they said it sounded like a, a bomb going off. So our next photo is from the Enterprise Bulletin, and this shows the uh, Steakhouse building you can barely make out the Chalet Normand Steakhouse. Mostens and Mary Lynn uh, were clothing stores. And that was the Melville Fair Company originally. And you can see that the top portion of that building, which had been four stories with a mansard roof as the fourth floor, it was elaborately rebuilt in brick after the fire without the mansard roof. And it's unusually tall for a three-story building because it looks out of proportion to the three-story building that's just on its left. Now, the single-story buildings at 33 and 35 here on Ontario Street now occupy the site of those two buildings. And so you have uh, Blue Bottles, uh, the Post Office, Style Boutique, and Dollar Villa. By studying the various accounts of the fire and matching those up with old photos and drawings, it's now possible to stand on here on Ontario Street at number 35, which is Dollar Villa, right here. If you stand in front of Dollar Villa and look at their south wall, you can visualize everything destroyed from that point all the way to the corner of Simcoe Street, and then everything across Simcoe to St. Marie, and then everything down St. Marie Street to just before Dr. A.R. Stevens' house, as well as the buildings in the back lane. All that remained standing between here, Ontario and St. Marie Streets were the few buildings at the very north end of here, Ontario, and those facing out onto Huron Street, and as well as Dr. Stevens' house. Now, the total loss from the Great Fire was estimated at a quarter of a million dollars, and it was a vast amount of money in 1881. The largest loss, Lawn Brothers, who lost $100,000. And only part of that was insured. I mean, they were 
very successful businessmen, but they did not have adequate insurance. One of the smaller losses was $150 for the millinery shop where everything was destroyed, including the sewing machine. On the west side of the street, three of the wooden buildings were owned by Longs, and they had no insurance at all on those. The next two wooden buildings were owned by Bernard Callery, who had them insured for about one quarter of their value. And six of the frame stores on the east side, going north from Simcoe Street, were all owned by Melville Fair and Company, and again, they were all wood. Now there were some, uh, if you're wondering, did anyone die on the fire? Apparently not. However, some individuals sustained injuries. <coughs> Mr. W. A. Hogg of the Enterprise newspaper got his hair and face slightly singed while assisting in removing goods from Mr. P. W. Bell's store. Lawyer John Burney and Mr. J. C. Petherham had to leap from the veranda roof below Mr. Burney's second floor office window and they were severely bruised. Mr. Burney sprained both of his ankles Mr. Petherham was injured in the chest and head. Mr. Charles Nettleton got his face and right hand severely burned while helping in the work of removal. And Mr. J. L. Cox, who was assisting with the hand-pumped fire engine, overexerted himself and fainted and remained unconscious for some length of time. Because, like I said, if you look up at the videos of those hand tubs, it's absolutely frantic what it took to make them work. Now we come to the aftermath. Our next photo, this is the following day. The north end of downtown Collingwood was a scene of devastation when the sun rose the following morning. Between St. Marie Street and both sides of the first block of here, Ontario, multiple buildings were a heap of smoldering, smoking rubble, and the street itself was a sea of mud. Um, I think those posts that you see laying on the ground, those were probably veranda posts. Um, Looking south in this view, you can see in the distance on the left, the tallest building is the Grand Central Hotel, and the name Collins can be made up just through the smoke. You can see Trott's building on the right-hand side, which was built not too long before the fire. And there's several people are standing on a large pile of rubble on the left, and I suspect that that is the debris from Long's four-story building, because it was the tallest building that probably made the largest heap of debris. The next photo, now this is significant because Melissa Shaw and I puzzled over this over the telephone some time ago and what you're seeing here is the back lane that runs from Simcoe down to Huron Street and you're looking more or less north, northwest. The tallest building, the first tall building that's still standing is the burned out shell of Melville Fair and Company, and you can see the angle of the bricks at the front shows you where the uh, mansard roof used to be. And that's followed by E.R. Carpenter's building, and then Lindsay's Masonic building, and beyond that you can just make out the hip roof of the wooden North American Hotel in the distance. Across the street, through the smoke, like a ghost, you can see Long and Cameron's new brick block that was just nearing completion at the time of the fire. Among the museum's photo collection is this next one, showing the gallant men of the Georgian Fire Brigade who fought the Great Fire, and they are posing with their equipment in the general area of the sawmill at the foot of Pine Street. In the center background, you can perhaps make out the Grand Trunk wooden grain elevator. It's very faint, but it's there. And on the far right, there's a wooden ship under construction in the area that years later would become the Collingwood Shipyard. Now that wooden boat could be perhaps being built by the Watts family or maybe Alfred Morrill, because this is prior even to the inauguration of the dry dock. My great grand uncle Fred O'Brien is standing on the very far left in front of the hand engine with its long pumping handles. In the middle is the Silsby steam pumper and on the far right is the hose reel. Now you note this photo is wrinkled. This sustained water damage from the 1963 fire at the Carnegie Library building, which also housed the Huron Institute Museum on the lower level. This photo is one of those that I helped remove from their frames and laid out on blotting paper to dry in the days following that fire. It seems to me rather ironic that a photo of the Georgian Fire Brigade should have suffered water damage in a fire 82 years later. <laughs> there it is. Now, 
I'd like you to consider how things could have been much worse if this fire had happened in the winter, when the streets were deep in drifted snow. That would have presented an entirely different scenario for the volunteer firemen attempting to move their heavy equipment through deep snow, when, in the absence of snow plows, the only practical way to get around was on foot or by a horse-drawn sleigh. Tragic as the Great Fire was, if it had to happen at all, it was merciful that it occurred before winter set in, otherwise the destruction would have been much greater and a significant portion of the town would probably have been lost. So the town council gets down to business now. Mayor Dudgeon called a special meeting of the town council for Monday afternoon, the day after. Among the things discussed was the fact that of the fire brigade's 1,200 feet of hose, only 500 feet were good enough to use, the other 700 being apparently useless and more than a thousand feet of hose was necessary. Now, fire hoses, you've seen fire hoses today, and you compare that to what they looked like back then. In that era, fire hoses were made of strips of thick rear quarter cowhide leather riveted together. Right after use or when being stored, the hoses had to be carefully treated with a leather conditioner such as fish oil, warm beef tallow, or neat's foot oil to keep them pliable, Otherwise, they would dry, crack, and rot, and fail at the most inopportune time. Councillor Charles Stevens suggested it was time to push for a waterworks. Reeve John Hogg stated that an efficient hook and ladder company was necessary, because the previous one had been disbanded, and if there had been one with proper equipment, they could have pulled down multiple verandas so that the fire would have stopped at longs instead of jumping from building to building. So it was moved, seconded, and carried that the Fire and Water Committee be instructed to purchase 1,000 feet of hose at once. It was also moved, seconded, and carried that Council consider the great necessity for the formation of an efficient hook and ladder company. The Mayor suggested a bylaw should be introduced forbidding the building of any more verandas and that storekeepers should use awnings instead. A two-man committee was appointed to draft, to draft such a bylaw. There were also suggestions of having an iron pipe laid down here on Ontario Street, tapped by hydrants at different places, and fed by a steam forcing engine at the foot of the street, drawing water from the harbor. The town clerk was instructed to thank the Northern Railway and the town of Stainer for their assistance in bringing the Stainer fire engine to Collingwood. And then also on the Monday and the Tuesday, the two days after, the safes belonging to Long Brothers and W.A. Hogg were dug out of the rubble uninjured, but they were good safes. If you've seen any of the old safes in town, they all say J and J Taylor. Um, so the fire brigade met Monday evening and they prepared an address to be presented to the town council at their next meeting. It contained a list of wants, including a large hose reel, a thousand feet of hose, various other hardware, including one axe and six lanterns and the formation of a hook and ladder company. I'm puzzled as to why they only wanted one axe. You'd think they could make <laughs> use of more than that. Now, the Enterprise newspaper was totally burned out in this disaster, and they were a total loss, and only one-third of their stuff was insured. So they didn't get going for some time. So that left the Bulletin newspaper housed in a somewhat safer spot, although they did start to dismantle their press just in case, so the bulletin printed their coverage of the fire on September 28th, three days after the event. Now, many of you know the Enterprise was a staunchly conservative newspaper in its editorial policy, whereas the bulletin was staunchly liberal. And it was customary for the two papers to trade editorial insults in print back and forth, similar to what we see on the evening news on television when the networks cover question period in the House of Commons. <laughs> This animosity between the two papers continued more or less until 1932 when, in the depths of the Great Depression, with both of them facing financial disaster, they decided to get married and to bury the hatchet. In the short term, at least, following the fire, the bulletin had a clear field for comment. And so here's some of the comment. An editorial appeared entitled, Lights Wanted. And as I read this, you'll note the veiled reference to the competition in the following words. No action has been taken about those lights. On Monday night, a string was tied across the tan bark sidewalk in front of the ruins on here Ontario Street. If there had been a light there, the trick would have been discovered in time to save a number of gentlemen 
including a newspaper man with whom we are personally acquainted, from taking a disagreeable and ungraceful tumble. Does the council prefer waiting until someone breaks neck or limb and brings a suit for damages before they will abate the annoyance caused by traveling our streets after dark? Perhaps the legislators are too busy canvassing to pay any attention to these little affairs, but we want those street lights, want them bad. And if our town rulers won't supply them, they'd better give place to a council that will. <laughs> now, after tan bark was used in the tanning process, the spent material was used as ground cover, much like the bark mulch you buy today at a garden center. And that prompted the following comment in the bulletin, titled, Tan Bark. The abominable nuisance of wading through the composition of wet tan bark and mud in front of those ruins calls forth many a wrathful denunciation of our Board of Works. If the chairman of that body is too indifferent to overexert himself in the matter, we are sure the businessmen of the town would willingly subscribe a sum sufficient to make the slough passable. By doing so, they would, in addition to benefiting themselves, earn the thanks of the female portion of the community, whose struggles to get through that part of the walk are too excruciating for anything. We will cheerfully head or foot such a list with the dollar bill left with us this morning by a subscriber. So you've got all this drama going on about mud and ruins and wet tan bark, but some of the merchants who were sharp businessmen, they got right to carrying on business the next day. Others who were wiped out did not have sufficient capital to start over or may have had just enough insurance to pay off their creditors. And just like today, some had no insurance. Making use of alternate facilities where available, some undaunted merchants reopened for business in short order, selling damaged goods as well as new stock. W.R. Anderson, whose hardware store was the first to catch fire on the west side of the street, had a large and valuable stock of stoves, tinware, and general hardware, some of which was removed either to the street or the backyard, but damaged nevertheless. And our next image. So here we have W.R. Anderson, uh, I'll just read the small print. They have removed to the building in the rear of Cameron and Long's new block opposite Lindsay Hunter and McDonald's where the stock saved from the late fire will be sold cheap. <laughs> and of course, that is now Long Lost parking lot. W.J. Frame, who suffered a total loss of 27000 was unlucky again nine years later when he lost a building in the next block when the new town hall burned in 1890. After the great fire, W.J. Frame, he simply placed his name in large letters below Anderson's ad, and just above the ad for D. Langell's Asthma and Qatar Remedy, warranted to relieve the most stubborn case of asthma in five minutes, one dollar a bottle. Mr. Langell would have loved the internet to sell his product, wouldn't he? <laughs> now, also undaunted, the morning after the fire, the Longs sent three of their staff on the train to Toronto to the wholesale suppliers to keep their business going. So we have an ad for Longs here. And they reopened for business in at least two locations, one on Huron Street and one opposite the market, because it seems they own property all over the place. And they had uh, piles of new goods daily and so on, a great rush of customers. The next scan is Melville Fair and Company, who have all sorts of new stock arriving all the time. And the next one was Guilfoyle Brothers, who relocated next to the market, and they were selling off $5,000 worth of goods saved from the fire at a great reduction. So now we come to the rebuilding of the main street. Now, given the technology available at the time, it must have been quite an effort to clear away all the debris. Horses, wagons, and handcarts would have hauled the bulk of the refuge away once it was cold. A lot of human and horsepower, together with a lot of shovels, was needed to deal with it all, considering that dump trucks, bulldozers, and backhoes were a long way off in the future. Usable bricks were piled up for the rebuilding, and the brickyard on Ragland Street must have had plenty of work on its order book. There was also plenty of work if you were a bricklayer. You have to wonder if all the debris was simply and expediently dumped into the harbor to create more land. Early maps indicate that most of the area directly north of First and Huron Street from Heritage Drive over to at least the foot of Maple Street was originally water, and all of that land is man-made. And it was created variously by the Ontario Simcoe and Huron Railway, the Queen's Dry Dock, which eventually became the shipyard, and by the large sawmill at the foot of Pine Street. So the rubble from the Great Fire could very well be buried under part of the waterfront land of today. Instead of a landfill, it was a harbor fill. 
The next image is a hand-drawn plan of the rebuilding of the main street. Um, what it shows is the east side, at the very top, is the corner of Huron Street, the large three-story graves block. In the middle, a major feature is the still-standing three-story Carmichael block, which you saw earlier, on the site of what used to be the North American Hotel. And the three businesses indicated at the bottom, if you want to look from the bottom up, Dry Goods, Melville Fair, Drugs E.R. Carpenter, Dry Goods, James Lindsay, those three buildings survived the Great Fire, and all three of them were lost to fire in the 20th century. The next image, I think many of you know this building, except every time I see this, it looks top heavy without any buildings on either side of it. It looks like it, looks like it could tip over. I'm sure it wouldn't, but a very beautiful building with a lot of very ornate brickwork, which we could still admire today. Uh, the book Reflections tells us that this building at 51 here Ontario Street, which is now Caro, or Caro Design, is that correct? Was the first, if not one of the first new buildings to rise from the ashes, housing the liquor store of Nettleton, Lindsay and Company. Remember, there was more than one Nettleton and there was more than one Lindsay. Um, it looks kind of top heavy, but again, they built new buildings on either side and it remains to this day. Fifty years ago, it was Herb Chapman's Rexall Drugstore. And no doubt, when this opened as a liquor store, there's no doubt there was plenty of thirst in Collingwood connected with the rebuilding. The book Whiskey and Wickedness tells us that Collingwood was a hard drinking town in those days when alcohol fueled much rowdy behavior and violence and that the hard drinking was equated with virility. That's what it said. <laughs> the newspaper accounts do not indicate that any saloons were lost in the Great Fire. However, there could very well have been liquor in some of the buildings. To give you an idea of what could have happened if a wooden saloon had caught fire in 1881, consider this. In 1905, when the old James Lindsay building, the one with the weather vane and the masonry plaque, when it was destroyed by fire, it contained, among other businesses, a liquor store on the ground floor. The fumes from the broken whiskey bottles caused a massive explosion that blew out an entire brick wall. It's no wonder whiskey was called fire water. <laughs> this reminds me of a humorous piece of writing called A Letter from an Irish Mother to Her Son, which contains the following. Your Uncle Patrick drowned last week in a vat of whiskey in the Dublin brewery. Some of his workmates tried to save him, but he fought them off bravely. <laughs> They cremated him, and it took three days to put out the fire. <laughs> fire water, indeed. So, gradually, over the next two decades, a number of new brick buildings were erected, and our next photo shows, you should all recognize this. It's on the corner of Simcoe in here, Ontario, and there's a wing that goes way along to the lane on Simcoe Street. It's a three-storefront building. So here we can see that as was enacted by the town council after the fire, there are no wooden verandas. At least two of these stores have awnings that can be cranked down to shield the stores from the afternoon sun. You still have wooden sidewalks and wooden ramps over the ditch, still a fire hazard, but not to the extent they were a year earlier. Visible on the very far left is the exterior south wall of another new brick building, which is now the home of the potato factory. And between these new buildings, you can pick out the remains of the stone house that was owned by Charles Cameron, which was destroyed. I mean, the, the interior of the house was destroyed. The, the stones were still there. And that ruin remained until 1901, when my great-grandfather O'Brien purchased that 22-foot wide lot from Charles Cameron for $3,300, and erected his own store and warehouse on it, designed by Fred Hodgson. And that is now 69 here on Ontario Street, and it's now occupied by Poise on Main. This building was only nine years old when the interior was completely gutted by a fire in 1910, cause unknown, but because it was an infill with its own exterior walls between two previously constructed buildings, it remained standing and was rebuilt within its external walls. So eventually, most of the entire east side of that block from here on to Simple Street was a row of two and three-story brick buildings, some with very ornate decorative brickwork, and most of them still stand to this day. O'Brien's building at number 69 was the last one to complete the south end. 
and they are a tribute to the merchants of Collingwood and their determination not to be defeated by the flames of September 1881. Our next photo shows the east side of here, Ontario Street in 1928. So you can see substantial brick buildings marching virtually all the way down to the end of the street. And the next photo, here we have the Kilty Band marching in the Orange Parade in 1925. You see there's a wooden shop just to the left of the Carmichael building and then there's an empty lot with a billboard on it and a tree behind it. And that remained empty for some time, well into the 20th century. And today, it is number 13 here in Ontario, and according to the signs outside, it's the home to Expedia Cruise Ship Centre and Global Expressions, plus a law office. In the 1960s, that was Canadian Tire. On the west side of the street, between 1st and 2nd, new two- and three-story brick buildings stretched from today's north side of the Federal Building right to the corner of 1st Street with a gap for Cameron Park. The Federal Building completed that block during the First World War. The Huron Institute papers confirm that Cameron and Long's new block was just about ready for occupancy at the time of the fire. And there, the prosperous Long brothers occupied three stores, and as mentioned before, some of that was lost in the 1953 fire. Our last photo is this beautiful building, the Henderson Building, built in 1884. And I just learned that date today in my research at the library. Built in 1884, destroyed by fire in 1925. There was a knitting mill on the two upper floors and a, an abandoned theater on the ground floor. And um, just incredibly beautiful brickwork. Uh, the firemen succeeded in putting the fire out, leaving the walls standing. And then that night, there's apparently a big wind and rainstorm, and the walls just came crashing down out into the street. So in 1932, the Bull Brothers built their garage and gas station there. Years later, you remember it was Lockhart Motors. And eventually that gave way to other businesses and ultimately to Loblaws. And as mentioned earlier, in February 1953, a massive fire took out a portion of what had been Long and Cameron's new building north of the Federal Building. So bit by bit, through either fire and or demolition, many of these buildings just gave way to the parking lot that's there today. Other substantial brick buildings elsewhere on here in Ontario were lost to fire in the 20th century, in particular the Stevens Block and the Arlington Hotel, adjacent buildings south of the Town Hall, both destroyed in separate fires in the 1980s and since replaced with modern buildings. And on the opposite side, the Temple Building from 1890, the home of the Masons and the Oddfellows, that was lost to fire in 2000, but unlike in the aftermath of other disastrous fires, the Temple Trustees had this one rebuilt to look similar to the original. So, to sum up, the brick buildings on the east side of the first block of here, Ontario Street, that survived the Great Fire of 1881, are all gone, having succumbed in the 20th century either to fires or to demolition. The brick buildings that were erected after the Great Fire line the east side of that block, their facades in some cases much altered from the original. Nevertheless, they have stood there for up to 135 years some of them surviving fires of their own in the 20th century and still standing as a testament to the merchants of Collingwood who had them built, to the architects who designed them, the contractors who built them, and to modern methods of firefighting that a number of times have preserved the outer structure when fire destroyed the interior. We've seen that here Ontario Street began its function as the downtown business section, logically at first with all wooden buildings, because that was the most expedient form of construction given the abundance of timber that covered Simcoe County. Then, just several years after the founding of the town, there began a gradual trend to brick commercial buildings mixed in with the wood, and of course this was fast-tracked after 1881. In the space of 20 years following the Great Fire, the east side of the first block of here Ontario Street was largely complete, and the majority of those buildings are still with us today, and they form the character of the northern end of the Heritage District. Today, uh, fire is still a serious emergency threatening life and property. It seems remarkable that no one is reported to have died in this great fire. The next time you see our modern day firefighting apparatus go screaming by on their way to an emergency, perhaps you will take a moment's pause to think of the panic, the fear, and the sense of helplessness felt by the citizens of Collingwood on that Sunday afternoon 
136 years ago, when the volunteer brigade, with what equipment they had, had to decide to let the wooden buildings burn in order to try to save the remaining brick ones in an effort to prevent the loss of an entire city block. Our ancestors responded to the situation as best they could. They rebuilt bigger and better and left us a legacy of Victoria era buildings that defined so much of downtown Collingwood. Thank you for listening.